Hi and welcome to uh, this webinar on um, the, the CQC's KLOE, the Caring KLOE. Um, my name is Alex O'Neill, as most of you are probably aware by now and those watching on YouTube as well. Uh, I'm Code's Professional Services Manager, uh, which means I do many things including uh, leading our consultant team and writing a lot of the information on iComply. Uh, I also do quite a bit of the research uh, into the, the KLOEs and the CQC regime uh, so that we can feed this back to you and help you uh, with your inspections and help you to have uh, quality practices. Um, so today I'm, I want to talk to you about the, uh, the caring KLOE, which is actually the smallest of the key lines of inquiry. Um, as healthcare providers, it's, it's probably little surprise to everybody that the, the CQC are finding very, very few problems under this KLOE. Um, what we're going to see is that the, the inspection prompts are actually quite straightforward. Uh, and the CQC's assessment of this key line of inquiry uh, seems mostly based on observations uh, when they're in your practice, so sat in your waiting room and observing your team or observing treatments, um, and conversations with both team members and with your patients. We do know that the, the inspections that we've heard about, they've been interviewing almost every single team member in your practice and, and asking them quite uh, searching questions. Um, as always, there's a little bit of a, a crossover between KLOEs. Um, uh, for example, with, with this KLOE, with caring, there's, there's information governance is covered, privacy and confidentiality. Um, and that's also covered a bit in SAFE uh, as well. Uh, but in a nutshell, being caring um, under the, the new regime and using the key lines of inquiry comes down to treating patients with respect, dignity and equality uh, and upholding principles of uh, confidentiality as well as listening to your patients, giving them the information and the time to make informed decisions about treatment. So that's the bottom line of what caring is. So as I said, it's, it's actually quite uh, a straightforward one and quite simple. To, uh, for the, for, as, uh, uh, excuse me, as this is verifiable CPD, we need aims, objectives and outcomes. Uh, the aim is to increase understanding of the new inspection regime and to help practices prepare for inspection. So uh, I've looked at the, the CQC have published 10 new reports, so I've looked at all of those reports to help give you this information and then hopefully that should help you um, with making sure that you're up to scratch with the new regime. Uh, the objectives are to examine the inspection prompts for caring in uh, the provider handbook, to explore the CQC's examples of evidence for caring in the provider handbook, to look at how practices are being judged regarding caring in recently uh, published inspection reports, which, I, as I always say, I think is the most important thing, is what's actually coming out on the, the inspection reports. And we're going to also just examine the proper use of related to-dos in iComply. Uh, there seems to be some confusion over the difference between to-dos and related to-dos and how they can be used, especially uh, for quality assurance purposes. So I'm going to look at that in a bit of depth as well. Okay, so the learning outcomes. Um, hopefully by the end of this session, the idea is that you should be able to explain to people what the CQC mean by caring, explain to your team, have a better understanding of it, uh, to describe the caring inspection prompts and explain what the CQC are looking for. Um, you should hopefully be able to use to-dos and related to-dos in iComply effectively, and to demonstrate to an inspector how your practice is caring using the KLOE report. So we'll have a, a look at the KLOE report on caring as well. We won't go into that into too much depth. Okay, so moving on. Key lines of inquiry, uh, obviously safe and well-led. We've covered already, they're very large. Today we're gonna cover caring. And then in uh, later webinars, we will be covering effective and responsive. And I'll cover, uh, towards the end of this session, I'll talk about what we're going to do in the next few webinars as well. Um, so we're, today we're looking at caring, uh, and caring KLOE is related to the fundamental standards. So as always, if you don't have the iComply system, which has the, uh, the, um, the fundamental standards and the KLOE reports built in to help you, and you want to look at this yourself and see how the CQC are going to assess whether you're caring, what you can do is go and get the fundamental standards document, get the provider handbook from the CQC website, and you can start comparing what they're looking at under this KLOE. Um, and by caring, what they've said is by caring, we mean that staff involve and treat people with compassion, kindness, dignity, and respect. Um, so, um, dignity and respect, I'll just mention that now because it, it, it's actually probably an important point that dignity and respect is starting to have a far larger focus uh, 
with the CQC. They are looking at it in a, a lot more detail. Uh, we've updated our documents recently in iComply. Uh, we've uh, rewritten one of the modules and it's now uh, Equality, Dignity and Human Rights. Uh, which I'll, I'll talk about later, um, and we've got an upcoming course to, to address this issue. We're going to be releasing a new DVD course soon, uh, so if you do want that extra bit of training, uh, you, you will be able to, to uh, get a DVD from us. So moving on from that, so a caring practice. So just to look at, this is taken from one of the CQC inspection reports, and this is an example of what they would consider to be a good caring practice. And the CQC have said that we found that this practice was caring in, in accordance with the relevant regulations. Patients were treated with dignity and respect. They had their privacy maintained. Uh, patient information and data was handled confidenti confidentially, so information governance. Patients told us, so they're interviewing patients and talking to them, that they feel listened to and treatment was clearly explained to them. Nervous patients were reassured. Uh, so that's the emotional care aspect. Um, uh, patients were given time to consider their treatment options and felt involved in their care and their treatment, um, which obviously is very important. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Patients were often contacted after receiving treatment to check on their welfare. I know most practices will do that, you know, post extraction calls the next day, make sure the parents are, parents, sorry, the patient is okay. Uh, or if you've placed an implant or anything, it, it's, very, it's, it's good practice to call them. Uh, people with urgent dental needs or in pain were responded to in a timely manner, often the same day, also in an, em an empathetic manner, which we will see. Ooh. Less caring practices. Um, I won't read these all, but the, the top one you can see that uh, that's about a practice where there wasn't enough space for the patients to sit in the waiting room. Uh, so the waiting room wasn't really fit for purpose and patients were having to sit, I think it was on a, uh, a wooden box. Uh, which the CQC inspector wasn't impressed by. Um, they were also concerned that the, the, the team were concerned that the door of the office, which they said was only big enough for one person, so it would be very difficult for the practice managers to discuss a complaint with a patient, um, opened onto a patient waiting area and they were, they were concerned about confidentiality as well, uh, that, the, um, that the patients could overhear confidential conversations. Uh, so obviously those are concerns that you may want to think about in your practice. Um, yes, so they also said we noticed on the day of inspection one of the surgery doors could not be closed properly and this meant that conversations could be overheard in the reception area. Now, I know of one practice where they had a, it was a modern build and they had a gap at the top of each surgery and saloon doors. Uh, so you could sit in the waiting room and you could hear three, converse three confidential conversations going on at the same time. Now I know this is a, obviously at one end of the spectrum, but it, it's always a good thing to sit in your waiting room and, and just listen. And just listen and see what you can see and, and hear what you can hear. And is confidentiality being breached? Because that's what the inspector is going to do. So it's, it's always a good thing for you to do yourself, to, just to see what your reception team are doing and whether or not you can hear things that are going on in the surgeries. Okay, so, caring prompts and examples of evidence. So you can see here, the, this is taken directly from the handbook. These are the prompts that they're looking for. So C1, are people treated with kindness, dignity, respect and compassion while they receive care and treatment? C2, uh, how are patients and those close to them involved as partners in their care? And C3, do people who use services and those close to them receive the support they need to cope emotionally with their care and treatment. Uh, there's a lot in here, and, and you can see the examples of evidence on the right, so I, I won't go through those line by line. But so, as, as I said, C1 Dignity, Respect, Human Rights is a large focus now, so this, we have updated our documents for you. C2, Patients Feel Listened To. Um, this, this can be quite important because in, in a busy practice, I, I have personally managed complaints where the patient was concerned that they felt that the dentist didn't listen to them, that they were just another person having an examination going through a system, as it were, and they didn't feel the patient. The actual complaint was that the dentist didn't look at them in the, in the eye and didn't go eye to eye to them, they just stayed behind them on the computer. So this probably isn't a problem in any of your practices, but it's just something to think about. Uh, C3, enough time. Uh, sorry, C2, um, where was it? Patients are given to enough time. Uh, obviously this is really important. It can be quite tempting. Um, after an examination if there's space in the diary to go straight into treatment but you do need to consider whether or not the patients had enough time to consider their options 
and to give informed consent. Every now and again, if a patient's seen and you can do the treatment after and they do consent and it's something simple, fair enough. But if it's endemic in a practice, if you look at a practice di diary and, they, um, and, uh, and then the CQC inspector looks at a practice diary and saw this habit, then maybe that's something they would question, they want to look at a, a, a bit deeper. They'd feel like patients were not being given enough time and therefore can't give consent. Uh, and C3, uh, nervous, uh, you know, the patients are supported and, and staff respond to pain, distress and discomfort in a timely and appropriate way. So nervous patients and patients in pain can, as we all know, can quite often come across as being rude. And they're not rude, they're just, they're in pain, they're, they're hurting. And it's, and uh, do, do the team know how to deal with this with empathy? Um, it's, very, it's a very human response to respond to aggression with aggression and, and seasoned receptionists know how to deal with these situations. But your younger nurses who have been trained on reception for the first time may need a bit of that extra training to make sure of some role playing that they've actually, uh, they know how to deal with these situations when a patient is being a little bit more aggressive maybe because they're in pain. Kim, uh, Kim just asked a question, uh, which I actually will, I will answer right now. Kim's just said, how do you keep confidentiality regards to C2 involving partners, etc.? I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail about that, but it's, it's a very tricky one for a practice because technically speaking, as we all know, you can only disclose information to the patient. And when you're dealing with, say, PAs for executives, if you have a pri private practice and you have that sort of demographic, uh, it can be very difficult if they've not got permission. And all I would say is you need to have an information governance policy and procedure in place and you need to follow it. Uh, and uh, I, I won't say how that would all work for your practice, but I know that it is an issue of, um, you know, if you're dealing with someone's partner and they ring up, technically speaking, if you're following the letter of the law, you should not speak to that person at all without the permission of the patient. Okay, so how the CQC will judge whether you are caring. Uh, from the, the reports that I've been reading, it's very simple. They're going to review comments cards that they send you two weeks in advance. They're going to talk to your patients when they come there. They're going to observe behaviours in the practice. They'll sit in your reception. And they're going to talk to the team as well. And they're going to interview your team. Um, so uh, just some quotes from the actual inspection reports. Uh, we noticed that a nervous patient was attended to with sensitivity and kindness by the team and we observed patients were dealt with it in a kind and compassionate manner. We observed staff dealing with patients on the telephone and saw them respond in an equally calm, professional manner. So they're observing your team and they're talking to your patients. Uh, patients said they felt the practice offered an excellent service. So just to give you some examples of the, the sort of quotes. Okay, moving on. So the caring report section. So on the, the uh, the CQC inspection report, there is a whole page about caring and these are the, the main themes that are being covered in caring. So, and, and obviously these are covered for you in iComply as well. So we've got respect, dignity, compassion and empathy, uh, which covers confidenti confidentiality and privacy, which is covered by the iComply confidentiality step. Uh, information and governance, which we cover very thoroughly with our M217 uh, information governance kit in iComply and the step. Emotional support and empathy. Uh, we've just released, I think it was a few weeks ago, and uh, if you've been following the iComply news, you will have adopted the new M233 ECA, which is our emotional care policy. Um, equality and discrimination, dignity and respect are all covered by our equality, dignity and human rights documents and policies, which we've just updated and are the latest item on iComply right now. So that's just, uh, that's just some idea of what they're covering in that section. And then the other section of the caring report, uh, they're, they're looking at can patients make informed choices? Uh, so are treatment plans given, including options, risks, benefits, clear costs? And obviously in iComply, we've got the treatment planning step and we've got the valid consent step, which will help you to meet these, uh, these inspection prompts. Um, giving patients enough time to make informed choices, we discussed earlier. Uh, and listening to patients and giving time to answer their questions. So not rushing them through, treating them as human beings, treating them as patients, um, which I'm sure we all do. Okay, so are you caring? Think like an inspector. I always like to give some, some little uh, hints and tips. Obviously myself and my team, we go in and we look at practices and uh, we're starting our new mock inspections 
in August. So if anyone is interested in a mock inspection, please let us know. We've been working very hard to, uh, to, to get it to, to mirror as closely as possible the CQC inspections. Uh, we've got a few in the diary already, but we do have some space if anybody would like one. Uh, so caring surface signs. So just a few things which I'm sure we all know, uh, but it's really good. Um, so personal information being discussed in reception, as I said before, go and sit down in reception and just see what you can hear. Uh, are, pa are they using patients' full names? Are, they, are patients being identifiable by the conversations having in you're having in reception? I remember once uh, when I, was, uh, I had a hospital appointment and I walked up to a counter and they had three or four files on the counter. So I could see all the patient information for about three or four patients. Obviously it wasn't a dental practice, but that was a, a kind of a, a, not a small breach of confidentiality. Security of patient notes, well that's along similar lines. A uh, uh, practice that, that I visited probably three, four months ago, uh, we walked into a, um, a surgery and the chair for, the, for whoever was accompanying the patient was next to a desk that was covered in notes for the last week and the next week. Uh, so I could see all of the patient notes for probably about 50 patients. Uh, so obviously pointed out to them that they probably should keep them securely. Uh, how your reception team treat patients, especially nervous patients, those with disabilities or those in pain. Uh, that's really interesting to, to watch as a manager or as a principal. And treatment plans. Um, very simple to see. You should have a signed, uh, well you should, you don't have to have a signed treatment plan technically. You should give a patient a treatment plan for every course of treatment and obviously your proof of that is to keep a signed copy. So just go and look through a few records and see are, are the signed treatment plans for your, all your treatments there. So how I comply helps you to be caring. Uh, we've got the up-to-date modules and policies, uh, which is actually on the next slide. Uh, but I've mentioned them already. We've got the upcoming course on equality, dignity and human rights, uh, which uh, the documents were written by the same person, co-written with us, Anne Kambata, fantastic uh, speaker. Uh, health checks and mock inspections. Uh, obviously we do do health checks, which are full day audits, uh, where we look at all the regulations. Uh, and mock inspections are most of the regulations, but with more interviews of your team, a bit more coaching about how to answer questions. Guidance based on actual inspections, or our documents and the information we're giving you now are based on conversations that we have with inspectors and, uh, sorry, conversations we have with people who have had inspections and people we know who know inspectors. And uh, the KLOE report caring prompts. Uh, we also have seminars. Uh, we, we are actually planning our next series of seminars, so uh, you'll be updated on what's going on with that. We'll have some evening events as well, where myself, Paul Mendelssohn, and potentially Anne will be talking at as well and free webinars, uh, which you're listening to right now, which we, we do one a month, um, where we try and give this information back to you. Uh, Karen has asked a really good question. Is a signed estimate proof of consent? Uh, no, it's not. The, the, the GDC standards state explicitly that a signed treatment plan is not proof of consent. Consent is, proof of consent is that options, risks, and benefits are discussed noted in your clinical notes and patients make an informed choice. Uh, I'd, I'd, I won't say that's not verbatim, word for word for what the GDC standards say, but it's actually very, very clear in the GDC standards that it's not a treatment plan. It's to do with the discussion between the dentist and the patient and the proof of that discussion are the contemporaneous records. So I hope that helps answer your question. Okay, so uh, we'll take a look at eye comply now. Um, what we're going to look at in iComply, we'll have a quick look at the KLOE report. Uh, and we'll have a look at the news section quickly, to see what's been updated there. And then we're going to discuss to-dos versus related to-dos. So looking at the news section, just, just to, to cover what we were saying, you can actually see now in the news section that we've updated our documents on equality, dignity and human rights. Now the instructions are in there and they're very clear. Uh, but I just wanted to point this out to everyone that, that it is very important that you read the news section probably at least once a week. Uh, we don't, we would not put news in there more than once a week. Uh, and it will give you very clear instructions on what to do. So if you've updated a document and you've already completed the step, you may have something new to do. Um, if we've updated documents or updated a step and you haven't completed it yet, then it will be there for you when you do it. So those of you who've already um, completed the human resource management step in month three of your cycle, uh, will want to actually look at these documents and do something, and they're there for you. Also, if I click on view all here, I can look at all the previous news as well. So in case I've missed something, if I've been away for a bit. So we can see down here, 
on the 14th of the 5th, 15, uh, we introduced the new emotional care policy, which is to help you meet the C3 standard to make sure that your team have a policy that is aimed at providing uh, emotional, uh, supporting uh, patients um, with the need to cope emotionally with their care and with their treatment. Uh, so you may want to implement that if you haven't yet. Okay, so going and looking at the iComply compliance report just very quickly. Uh, if we click on the compliance report down here on the left, and then up here I've got the KLOE report is up already, and I click on the inspection prompts. Now I'm going to go to the toggle button here, I'm going to click on caring, and I'm going to click to apply the filter. So, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can do this yourselves after the webinar. You can go and have a look and you can see what meets the caring prompts in iComply. And it's all the things that we've been discussing today. For example, patient confidentiality here, treatment planning and estimates, information governance, equality, dignity and human rights. So this is the compliance report that once you've completed these activities, it will show the inspector what you did, when you did it, what notes you've made and where you filed it. But what I really wanted to talk to you about today, if I go to the, my calendar, um, is to-dos versus related to-dos. Um, uh, to-dos and related to-dos should primarily be used to schedule actions arising from risk assessments, audits and practice meetings. Um, the main difference between them is that to-dos are separate from activities. Um, they exist on the calendar in their own right and they can be signed off without affecting activities. Related to-dos are linked to activities and you add them within the activity itself and they must be signed off before the activity is completed. So there's a few reasons you can do this and it's completely up to you how you want to use them. Um, related to-dos can also be used um, to stop a team member who you've delegated a task to signing something off before it's been checked by another person. So you can add a to-do, which we'll see, in order to make sure that you can check their work and sign it off before they are allowed to sign it off. So you can sign off the to-do before they're allowed to complete the step and put it in your audit trail. It'll add the entry to the compliance report. So using to-dos make sure that your quality assurance actions are recorded on your compliance report. They also help you uh, not to forget to complete actions and they will help an inspector to see how things have been followed up by you, which as we've discussed is very important in the quality assurance cycle, that you're not only doing these risk assessments, audits, practice meetings, but you are using the information you get from them to improve your practice, to improve the service and care that you give to your patients. Um, it's, it's important to note that you should probably only use to-dos um, for compliance related activity um, unless you're happy with the CQC uh, seeing something like buy the team lunch on your compliance report. So anything you use as a to-do will appear on your compliance report. So the bottom line with to-dos and related to-dos are you'd probably use a normal to-do when you want to sign off the activity, and we're going to look at this in a second, before you carry out the actions. And you want to use a related to-do when you want to complete the actions before signing off the activity, or as an administrator, if you want to have that level of control. So I'm not going to show you how to add a normal to-do to the calendar, but we're going to talk about the related to-do specifically. So we can see we're actually in here in iComply month one, and we've got a risk assessment here, which we've just done, theoretically. So if I click on this risk assessment, what you can see is that I'm responsible. So I'm the practice administrator and I'm responsible for this risk assessment. Now I've gone down to the bottom because I've already done the risk assessment. So what I've done is I've said any needed templates have been downloaded and reviewed because I downloaded the template. Templates have been updated, adapted and adopted as necessary and actions arising from this activity have been completed or have been scheduled to carry out, to be carried out. So this is the key point. So what I've done is I've downloaded the template, I adapted it to the practice and I carried out the audit. And I've identified a need to purchase some more eternal locks 
for the file storage room. I don't feel like it's secure enough. Like I, the information governance in the practice needs tightening up a little bit. Uh, it would be too easy for someone to access if they broke in. So what I'm going to do is I've decided that rather than sign this off now, I want to create a related to do so that I am, cannot sign off this activity until that's done. Now alternatively, what I might have done is put a normal to do on the calendar and sign this off and then have the to do. So I can choose either way, but this time what I'm going to do is click on the related to do here and I'm going to create a to do for myself. Alex O'Neill by locks. And description, I'll just put by locks. Uh, but I could I'd probably want to write a little bit more for the CQC inspector. By locks uh, due to information security risk assessment. So I'm going to create that for tomorrow because I can get them on my way into work. So I'll click create and you can see that's, that's on the calendar now here to buy the locks. If I go back to the risk assessment here and I try to sign it off, well sorry we can see firstly inside that uh, this particular activity it says here buy locks and it's not been completed yet. But what I will do is I'll click on buy locks here and I will complete that. Once I've completed that, if I go back to the risk assessment and I click to mark it as complete, oh sorry, I need to put which file it's in. It goes into folder one. It will now allow me to mark it as complete. So before it wouldn't allow me to mark it as complete, but now it will. Now, in an alternative situation, if I go back to the calendar, what I've got is the audit of infection prevention and control. Now if I click on the, the audit of infection prevention and control, you can see that this is responsible, Tina is the responsible person for this. So Tina's going to do this, but Tina's a new team member. And Tina, I think she's going to do a good job, but I don't want her to sign it off until I've checked it. So what I'm going to do is create a related to do inside there for me to check this. And I'm going to put that for the 8th of July. Now if I go inside that audit now, and we just tick the boxes if it's been done, and some evidence audit completed. So say Tina did this, and it's in I comply folder five, and we click to mark as complete, you have one error that needs to be fixed. And it says here, all to do's must be completed. So it's, it's actually, if that was Tina doing that, what that would do is it would actually, she would try and complete the activity and it would actually say, well, Alex needs to sign this off first. So hopefully that's explained the difference between related to do's and to do's. Um, so the main, as I said, you, you could use a to do when you want to sign off the activity before you carry out the actions and you can use related to do's when you want to complete the action, uh, when, you want, uh, when you want to complete the action before signing off the activity and also when you want to use it as a control method.